Hello again, and welcome to the next part of my complete reading of A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens. We are now at Stave 3, the second of the three spirits. Awaking in the middle of a prodigiously tough snore, and sitting up in bed to get his thoughts together, Scrooge had no occasion to be told that the bell was again upon the stroke of one. He felt that he was restored to consciousness in the night at the right nick of time for the especial purpose of holding a conference with the second messenger dispatched to him through Jacob Marley's intervention. But finding that he turned uncomfortably cold when he began to wonder which of his curtains this new spectre would draw back, he put them every one aside with his own hands, and lying down again, established a sharp lookout all around the bed, for he wished to challenge the spirit on the moment of its appearance, and did not wish to be taken by surprise and made nervous. <clears throat> Gentlemen of the free and easy sort, who plume themselves on being acquainted with a move or two, and being unusually equal to the time of day, express the wide range of their capacity for adventure by observing that they are good for anything from pitch and toss to manslaughter, between which opposite extremes, no doubt, there lies a tolerably wide and comprehensive range of subjects. Without venturing for Scrooge quite as handily or hardily as this, I don't mind calling on you to believe that he was ready for a good broad field of, stra field of strange appearances, and that nothing between a baby and a rhinoceros would have astonished him very much. Now, being prepared for almost anything, he was not by any means prepared for nothing, and consequently, when the bell struck one and no shape appeared, he was taken with a violent fit of trembling. Five minutes, ten minutes, a quarter of an hour went by, yet nothing came. All this time he lay upon his bed, the very core and centre of a blaze of ruddy light which streamed upon it when the clock proclaimed the hour, in which, being only light, was more alarming than a dozen ghosts. As he was powerless to make out what what it meant, or wouldn't be at, and was something apprehensive that he might, at, might be at that at very moment an interesting case of spontaneous combustion, without having the consolation of knowing it. At last, however, he began to think of as you or I would have thought at first, for it is always the person, not in the predicament, who knows what ought to have been done in it, and would unquestionably have done it too. At last, I say, he began to think that the source and secret of this ghostly light might be in the adjoining room, from whence, on further tracing, it seemed to shine. This idea, taking full possession of his mind, he got up softly and shuffled in his slippers to the door. The moment Scrooge's hand was on the lock, a strange voice called him by his name and bade him enter. He obeyed. It was his own room, there was no doubt about that. But it had undergone a surprising transformation. The walls and ceiling were so hung with living green that it looked a perfect grove, from every part of which bright gleaming berries glistened. The crisp leaves of holly, mistletoe and ivy reflected back the light as if so many little mirrors had been scattered there, and such a mighty blaze went roaring up the chimney as that dull petrification of a half had never known in Scrooge's time, or Marley's, or for many and many a winter season gone by. Heaped up on the floor to form a kind of throne were turkeys, geese, game, poultry, brawn, great joints of meat, suckling pigs, long wreaths of sausages, mince pies, plum puddings, barrels of oysters, red-hot chestnuts, cherry-cheeked apples, juicy oranges, luscious pears, immense twelfth cakes, and seething bowls of punch that made the chamber dim with their delicious steam. In easy state upon this couch there sat a jolly giant, glorious to see, who bore a glowing torch in shape not unlike a horn, plenty's horn, and held it up, held it up high up to shed its light on Scrooge as he came peeping round the door. Come in, explained the ghost. Come in and know me better, man. 
Scrooge entered timidly and hung his head before the spirit. He was not the dogged Scrooge he had been, and though the spirit's eyes were clear and kind, he did not like to meet them. I am the ghost of Christmas presents, said the spirit. Look upon me. Scrooge reverently did so. It was clothed in one simple green robe or mantle, bordered with white fur. This garment hung so loosely on the figure that its capacitor's breast was bare, as if it disclaiming to be warded or concealed by any artifice. Its feet, although observable through the ample folds of the garment, were also bare, and on its head it wore no other covering than a holly wreath, set there and there with shining icicles. Its dark brown curls were long and free, free as its genial face, its sparkling eye, its open hand, its cheery voice, its unconstrained demeanour, and its joyful air. Girded round its middle was an antique scabbard, but no sword was in it, and the ancient sheath was eaten up with rust. "'You've never seen the like of me before!' exclaimed the spirit. "'Never!' Scrooge made answer to it. "'Have never walked forth with the younger members of my family?' meaning, for I am very young, my elder brothers born in the le these later years, pursued the phantom. I don't think I have, said Scrooge. I'm afraid I have not. Have you, had, have you had many brothers, Spirit? More than eighteen hundred, said the ghost. A tremendous family provide for, muttered Scrooge. The ghost of Christmas present rose. Spirit, said Scrooge submissively. Conduct me where you will. I went forth last night on compulsion, and I learned a lesson which is woeful working now. Tonight, if you have aught to teach me, let me profit by it. Touch my robe. Scrooge did as he was told, and held it fast. Holly, mistletoe, red berries, ivy, turkeys, geese, game, poultry, brawn, meat, pigs, sausages, oysters, pies, puddings, fruit and punch, all vanished instantly. So did the room. In the fire, the fire, the ruddy, sorry, the fire, the ruddy glow, the hour of night, and they stood in the city streets on Christmas morning, where, for the weather was severe, the people made a rough but brick, brisk and not unpleasant kind of music, in scraping the snow from the pavements in front of their dwellings and from the tops of their houses, whence it was mad delight for the for the boy to the boys to see it coming plumping down into the road below and splitting into artificial little snowstorms. The house fronts looked black enough and the window was blacker, contrasting with the smooth white sheet of snow upon the roofs, and with the dirtier snow upon the ground, which had deposit been ploughed up in the deep furrows by the heavy wheels of carts and wagons, furrows that crossed and recrossed each other hundreds of times where the great streets branched off, and made intricate channels hard to trace in the thick yellow mud and icy water. The sky was gloomy, and the shortest streets were choked up with dingy mist, half thawed, half frozen, whose heavier particles descended in, show in a shower of sooty atoms, as if all the chimneys in Great Britain had by one moment caught fire and were blazing away to their dear hearth's content. There was nothing very cheerful in the climate of the town, and yet was there in an air of cheerfulness abroad that clearest summer air and brightest summer sun might endeavour to diffuse in vain. For well, the people who were shoveling away on the housetops were jovial and full of glee, calling out to one another from the parapets, and now and then exchanging a fa facetious snowball, better-natured missile for, for, for far than many a worldly wordy jest, laughing heartily if it, if it went right, none less heartily if it went wrong. The poulterers' shops were still half open, and the fruiterers were radiant in their glory. There were great round, round, pot-bellied baskets of chestnuts, shaped like the waistcoats of jolly old gentlemen, lolling at the doors and tumbling out into the street in their apoplectic copulence. There were ruddy, brown-faced, broad-girthed Spanish onions, shining in the fatness of their growth like Spanish friars, and winking from their shells in wanton shyness at the girls as they went by, and glanced demurely at the hung-up mistletoe. There were pears and apples, clustered high in blooming pyramids. There were bunches of grapes, made in the shopkeeper's benevolence to dangle from conspicuous hooks that people's mouths might water gratis as they passed there. There were piles of filberts, mossy and brown, 
recalling in their fragrance ancient walls amongst the woods, and pleasant shuff shufflings ankle-deep through withered leaves. There were Nor Norfolk biffins, squab and swarthy, setting off the yellow of the oranges and lemons, and in the great compactness of their juicy persons, urgently entreating and beseeching to, the, to be carried home in paper bags and eaten after dinner. The very gold and silver fish set forth among those choice fruits in a bowl, though the members of a dull and stagnant-blooded race appeared to know that there was something going on, and to a fish, and gasping round and round their little world in slow and passionless excitement. The grocers, oh, the grocers, nearly clothed with perhaps two shutters down or one, but through their, those gaps, such glimpses, it was not alone that the scales descended on the counter made a merry sound, or that the twine and roller parted company as brisk so briskly, or that the canisters were rattled up and down like juggling tricks, or even that the blended scents of tea and coffee were so great, graceful to the nose, or even that the raisins were so plentiful and rare, the almonds so extremely white, the sticks of cinnamon so long and straight, the other spices so delicious, the candied fruits so caked and spotted with molten sugar, as to make the coldest look onlookers feel faint and subsequently bilious. Nor was it that the figs were moist and pulpy, or that the French plums blushed in modest tartness from their highly decorated boxes, or that everything, everything was good to eat and its Christmas dress. But the customers were all so hurried and so eager in the hopeful promise of the day that they tumbled up against each other at the door, crashing, <laughs> crashing their wicker baskets wildly, and left their purchases upon the counter, and came running back to fetch them, and committed hundreds of little mistakes in the best humour possible, while the grocer and his people were so frank and fresh that the polished hearts with which they fastened their apron behind might have been their own, worn outside for general inspection, and for Christmas doors to speak to peck, peck at, if they, cho if they chose. But soon the steeples called good people all to church and chapel, and away they came, flocking through the streets in their best clothes and with their gayest faces. And at the same time there emerged from scores of by-streets, lanes, and nameless turnings innumerable people carrying their dinners to the baker's shops. The sight of these poor revellers appeared to interest the spirit very much, for he stood with Scrooge beside him in the baker's doorway, and taking off the covers as their bearers passed, sprinkled incense on their dinners from his torch. And it was a very uncommon kind of torch, for once or twice when there were angry words between some dinner carriers who had jostled each other, he shed a few drops of water on them from it, and their good humour were restored directly. For they said it was a shame to quarrel upon Christmas Day, and so it was, God love it, so it was. In time the bells ceased, and the bakers were shut up, and yet there was a genial shadowing forth of all these dinners and the progress of their cooking in the thawed blotch of wet above each baker's oven, where the pavement smoked as if its stones were cooking too. Is there a peculiar flavour in what you sprinkle from your torch? asked Scrooge. There is. My own. Would it apply to any kind of dinner on this day? asked Scrooge. To any kindly given, to a po poor one most. Why to a poor one most? asked Scrooge. Because it needs it most. Spirits, said Scrooge, after a moment's thought. I wonder you, of all the beings in the many worlds about us, should desire to cramp these people's opportunities of innocent enjoyment. Aye, cried the spirit. You would deprive them of their means of dining every seventh day, often the only day in which they can be said to dine at all, said Scrooge, wouldn't you? Aye, cried the spirit. You seek to clothe these places on the seventh day, said Scrooge, and it comes up the same thing. I seek. Forgive me if I'm wrong. It has been done in your name, or at least in that of your family, said Scrooge. There are some upon this earth of yours, returned the spirit, who lay claim to know us, and who their deeds of passion, pride, ill-will, hatred, envy, bigotry, and selfishness in our name, were as strange to us and all our kith and kin as if they had never lived. Remember that and charge their doings on themselves, not on us. Scrooge promised that he would, 
and they went on invisible, as they had been before, into the suburbs of the town. It was a remarkable quality of the ghost, which Scrooge had observed at the baker's, that notwithstanding his gigantic size, he could accommodate himself to any place with ease, and that he stood beneath a low roof quite as gracefully and like a supernatural creature as it was possibly could have done in any lofty hall. And perhaps it was the pleasure the good spirit had in showing off, it, off this power of his, or else it was his own kind, generous, hearty nature, and his sympathy with all poor men, that led him straight to Scrooge's clerks, for there he went, and took Scrooge with him, holding to his robe, and on the threshold of the door the spirit smiled, and stopped, and to bless Bob Cratchit's dwelling with the sprinkling of his torch. Think of that. Bob had but fifteen bob a week himself. He pocketed on Saturdays but fifteen copies of his Christian name, and yet the ghost of Christmas present blessed his four-roomed house. Then up rose Mrs. Cratchit, Cratchit's wife, dressed out, but poorly in a twice-turned gown, but brave in ribbons which are cheap and make a goodly show for sixpence, and she laid the cloth assisted by Belinda Cratchit, second of her daughters, also brave in ribbons, while Master Peter Cratchit plunged it a fork into the saucepan of potatoes, and getting the corners of his moon monstrous shirt collar, Bob's private property confirmed upon his son and heir in honour of the day, into his mouth, rejoiced to find himself so gallantly attired, and yearned to show his linen to the fashionable parks. And now two smaller Cratchits, boy and girl, came tearing in, screaming that outside the baker's they had smelt the goose, and known it for their own, and basking in luxurious thoughts of sage and onion, these young Cratchits danced upon the, about the table, and exalted Master Peter Cratchit to the skies, while he, not proud, although his collar nearly choked him, blew the fire until the slow potatoes bubbled up, knocked loudly at the saucepan lid to be let out and peeled. What has, ha what has ever got your precious father, then, said Mrs. Cratchit, and your brother, Tiny Tim, and Martha, weren't as late at last Christmas Day by half an hour. Here's Martha, mother, said a girl, appearing as she spoke. Here's Martha, mother, cried the two young Cratchits. Hurrah! There's such a goose, Martha. Why, bless your heart alive, my dear, how late you are, said Mrs. Cratchit, kissing her a dozen times and taking off her shawl and bonnet for her with officious, officious zeal. We'd a deal of work to finish up last night, replied the girl, and had to clear away this morning, mother. Well, never mind, so long as you're here, said Mrs. Cratchit. Sit you down before the fire, my dear, and have a warm, Lord bless you. No, no, there's father coming, cried the two young Cratchits, who were everywhere at once. Hide, Martha, hide! So Martha hid herself, and in came little Bob. The father wore at least three feet of comforter out exclusive of the fringe hanging down before him, and his threadbare clothes darned up and brushed to look seasonable, and tiny Tim upon his shoulder. Alas for tiny Tim, he bore a little crutch, and had his limbs supported by an iron frame. Why, where's our Martha? cried Bob Cratchit, looking around. Not coming, said Mrs. Cratchit. Not coming, said Bob, with a sudden de declension in his high spirits, for he had been ti Tim's blood horse all the way from church, and had come home rampant. Not coming upon Christmas Day? Martha didn't like to see him disappointed. It were only a joke, and she came out prematurely from behind the closet door and ran into his arms, while the two young Cratchits hustled tiny Tim and bore him off into the wash house that he might hear the pudding singing in the copper. And how did little time Tim behave? asked Mrs. Cratchit, when she had rallied Bob on his credulity, and Bob had hugged his daughter to his heart's content. As good as gold, said Bob, and better. Somehow he gets thoughtful, sitting by himself so much, and thinks the strangest things you ever heard. He told me, coming home, that he hoped the people saw him in the church, because he was a cripple, and might, it might be pleasant to them to remember upon Christmas Day who made lame beggars walk and blind men see. Bob's voice was tremendous when he told them this, and trembled more when he said that Tiny Tim was growing strong and hearty. His active little crutch was heard upon the floor, and back came Tiny Tim before another word was spoken, escorted by his brother and sister to his stool before the fire. And while Bob, turning up his cuffs, as a poor fellow they were capable of being made more shabby, compounded some hot must mixture in the jug with gin and lemon, and stirred it round and round and put it on the hob to simmer, 
Master Peter and the two ubiquitous young Cratchits went to fetch the goose, which they soon returned in high procession. Such a bustle ensued that you might have thought ensued that you might have thought a goose, the rarest of all birds, a feathered phenomenon, phenomenon to which a black swan was a matter of course. And in truth, it was something very like it in that house. Mrs. Cratchit made the gravy ready beforehand at a little saucepan, hissing hot. Master Peter mashed the potatoes with incredible vigour. Miss Belinda sweetened up the apple sauce. Martha dusted the hot plates. Bob took Tiny Tim behind, behind, beside him in a tiny corner of the, at the table. The two young Cratchits set chairs for everybody, not forgetting themselves, and mounting guard upon their posts, crammed spoons into their mouths, lest they should shriek for goose before their turn came to be helped. At last the dishes were set on, and grace was said. It was succeeded by a breathless pause, as Mrs. Cratchit, looking slowly all along the carving knife, prepared to plunge it in the hump in the breast. When she did, and when the long-expected gush of stuffing issued forth, one murmur of delight from a rose or arose all around the board, and even Tiny Tim, excited by the two, new, two young Cratchits, beat upon the table with the handle of his knife, and feebly cried, Hurrah! Never was such a goose. Bob said he didn't believe there ever was such a goose cooked. Its tenderness and flavour, size and cheapness were the themes of universal admiration. Eked out by apple sauce and mashed potatoes, it was a sufficient dinner for the whole family. Indeed, as Mrs. Cratchit said with great delight, surveying one small atom of a bone upon the dish. They hadn't, they hadn't, they hadn't ate it all, all at last, yet every one had had enough, and the youngest Cratchits in particular were steeped in sage and onion to the eyebrows. But now the plates being changed by Miss Belinda, Mrs. Cratchit left the room alone, too nervous to bear witness, to take the pudding up and bring it in. Suppose it should not be done enough. Suppose it should not break in turning out. Suppose somebody should have got over the wall of the backyard and stolen it while they were merry with the goose. Goose, a, a supposition at which the two young Cratchits became livid. All sorts of horrors were supposed. Hello! A great deal of steam. The pudding was out of the copper. A smell like washing day. That was the cloth. A smell like an eating house and pastry cooks next door to each other with the laundresses next door to that. That was the pudding. In half a minute, Mrs. Cratchit entered, flushed but smiling proudly with the punning, like a speckled cannonball, so hard and firm, blazing in half a quarter of ignited brandy, and bed bedight with Christmas holly stuck into the top. Oh, wonderful pudding, Bob Cratchit said, and calmly, too, that he regarded it as the greatest success achieved by Mrs. Cratchit since their marriage. Mrs. Cratchit said that now the weight was off her mind, she would confess she had had little doubts about the quality or quantity of flour. Everybody had something to say about it, but nobody said or thought it was all but, but a small, all, all a small pudding for a large family. It would mean a flat heresy to do so. Any Cratchit would have blushed to hint at such a thing. At last the dinner was all done, the cloth was, cloth was cleared, the hearth swept, and the fire made up. The compound and the jug being tasted and considered perfect, apples and oranges were put upon the table and shoved full of chestnuts on the fire. Then all the Cratchit family drew around the hearth in what Bob Cratchit called a circle, meaning half a one. And at Bob Cratchit's elbow stood the family display of glass, two tumblers and a custard cup without a handle. These held the hot stuff from the jug. However, as well as golden goblet, goblets would have done, and Bob served it out with beaming looks, while the chestnuts and the fire sputtered and crackled noisily. Then Bob proposed, A merry Christmas to us all, my dears. God bless us, which all the family re-echoed. God bless us, every one, said Tiny Tim, the last of all. He sat very close to his father's side upon his little stool. Bob held his withered little hand in his. As if he loved the child, as as if he loved the child and wished to keep him by his side, and dreaded that he might be taken from him. Spirit, said Scrooge with an interest he had never felt before. Tell me if Tiny Tim will live. I see a vacant seat, replied the ghost, in the poor chimney corner, and a crutch without an owner, carefully preserved. If these shadows remain unaltered, by the future, child will die. No, no, said Scrooge. 
O oh, my kind spirit, say you will be spared. If these shadows remain unaltered by the future, none other of my race, returned the ghost, will find him here. What then? If you be like to die, you better do it and decrease the surplus population. Scrooge hung his head to hear his own words quoted by the spirit and was overcome with penitence and grief. Man, said the ghost, if man you be in heart, not adamant, forbear that wicked cant until you've discovered what the surplus is and where it is. We decide what men shall live, what men shall die. It may be that in the sight of heaven you are more worthless and less fit to live than millions like this poor man's child. O oh God, to hear the inse uh, insect on the leaf pronouncing on the too much life among his hungry brothers in the dust. Scrooge bent before the ghost's rebuke, and trembling cast his eyes upon the ground. But he raised them speedily on hearing his own name. Mr. Scrooge, said Bob, I'll give you Mrs. Mr. Scrooge, the founder of the feast. The founder of the feast indeed, cried Mrs. Cratchit, reddening. I wish I'd him here. I'd give him a piece of my mind to feast upon. I hope he'd have a good appetite for it. My dear, said Bob, the children, Christmas Day. It should be Christmas Day, I'm sure, said she, and which one drinks the health of such an odious, stingy, hard, unfeeling man as Mr. Scrooge. You know he is, Robert. Nobody knows it better than you do, poor fellow. My dear, was Bob's mild answer, Christmas Day. I'll drink his health for your sake in the days, said Mrs. Cratchit. Not for his. Long life to him, and Merry Christmas, and a Happy New Year. He'll be very merry and very happy, I have no doubt. The children drank the toast after it. It was the first of their proceedings which had no heartiness. Tiny Tim drank at last of all, but he didn't care twopence for it. Scrooge was the ogre of the family. The mention of his name cast a dark shadow on the party which was not to be dispelled for a full five minutes. After it passed away, they were ten times merrier than before, from the mere relief at Scrooge, the baleful being at Dunwith. Bob Cratchit told them how he had a situation in his eye for Master Peter, which would bring him, if obtained, full five and sixpence weekly. The two young Cratchits laughed tremendously at the idea of Peter's being a man of business, and Peter himself looked thoughtfully at the fire from between his collars, as if he were deliberating what particular investments he should favour when he came to the receipt of that bewildering income. Martha, who was a poor apprentice to a milliner's, then told him what kind of work she had to do, and how many hours she worked at a, at a stretch. Now she meant to lie abed tomorrow morning for a good long rest. Tomorrow being a holiday, she passed at home. Also how she had seen a countess and lord some days before, and how the lord was much about as tall as Peter, at which Peter pulled up his collars so high he couldn't have seen his head if he had them there. On all this time the chestnuts and the jug went round and round, and by and by they had a song about a lost child travelling in the snow from Tiny Tim, who had a plaintive little voice and sang it very well indeed. There was nothing of high mark in this. They were not a handsome family. They were not well dressed. Their shoes were far from being waterproof. Their clothes were scanty, and Peter might have known, and very likely did, the inside of a pawnbroker's. But they were happy, grateful, pleased with one another, and contented with the time. And when they faded and looked happier yet in the bright sprinklings of the spirit's torch at parting, Scrooge had his eye upon them, especially on Tiny Tim, until the last. By this time it was getting dark and snowing pretty heavily, and as Scrooge and the spirit went along the streets, the brightness of the roaring fires and kitchens, parlours and all sorts of rooms was wonderful. Here the flickering of the blaze showed preparations for a cosy dinner, with the plates baking through and through before the fire, and deep red curtains ready to be drawn shut out cold shut drawn to shut out cold and darkness. There all the children of the house were running out in the snow to meet their married cousins, brothers cousins married sisters, brothers, cousins, uncles, aunts, to be the first to greet them. Here again were shadows on the window blind of guests assembling, and there were groups of handsome girls, all hooded and fur-booted, and all chattering at once, tripped lightly off to some near neighbour's house, where, woe upon the single man who saw them enter, artful witches well they knew it, in a glow. 
If you had judged from the number of people on their way to friendly ground gatherings, you might have thought that no one was at home to give them welcome when they got there, instead of every house expecting company and piling up the fires, half chimney high. Blessings on it, how the ghost exulted, how it bared its breadth of breast and opened its capacious palm and floated on, outpouring with a generous hand its bright and harmless mirth and everything within its reach. The very lamp lighter who ran on before, dotting the dusky street with specks of light, and was dressed to spend the evening somewhere, laughed out loudly as the spirit passed, though a little, ken little, though a little kenned to the lamplighter they had any company but Christmas. And now, without a word of warning from the ghost, they stood upon a bleak and desert moor, where monstrous masses of rude stone were cast about, as though it were the burial place of giants, and water spread itself wheresoever it listed, or would have done so but the thrill of frost that held it prisoner and nothing grew but moss and firs and coarse rank grass down in the west the setting sun had left a streak of fiery red which glazed upon the desolation for an instant while a sudden like a sullen eye and frowning lower 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 yet was lost was lost in the thick thick gloom of the darkest night what place is this sir asked scrooge a place where the miners live who labour in the bowels of the earth returned the spirit but they know me See? A light shone from the window of a hut, and swiftly they advanced towards it, passing through the wall of mud and stone. They found a cheerful company assembled round a glowing fire. An old man, old man and woman, with their children and their children's children, and another generation beyond that, all decked out gaily in the holiday attire. The old man, in a voice that seldom rose about the howling of the wind upon the barren waste, was singing them a Christmas song. It had been a very old song when he was a boy, and from time to time, they all joined in the chorus. So surely as they raised their voices, the old man was quite blithe and loud, and surely as they stopped, his vigour sank again. The spirit did not tarry here, but bade Scrooge hold his robe, and passing on above the moor, sped, whither? Not to see. To see! To Scrooge's horror, looking aback, he saw the last of the land, a frightful range of rocks behind them, and his ears were deafened by the thundering of water as it rolled and roared and raged upon the dreadful caverns it had worn, and fiercely tried to undermine the earth. Built upon the dismal reef of sunken rocks, some league or so from the shore, on which the waters chafed and dashed, the wild year through there stood a solitary lighthouse. Great heaps of seaweed clung to its base, and stormy birds, born of the wind, one might suppose, as seaweed off the water, rose and fell about it like the waves they skimmed. But even here, two men who watched the light that made a fire, even through the loophole of the thick stone wall, shed out a ray of brightness on the awful sea. Joining their horny hands over the rough table at which they sat, they wished each other Merry Christmas in their can of grog, and one of them, the eldest too, with his face all damaged and scarred with hard weather, as the figurehead of an old ship might be, struck up a sturdy song that was like a gale in itself. Again the ghost sped on, above the black and heaving sea, on, on, until the, being far away, as he told Scrooge from any shore, he lighted on a ship. He stood beside the helmsman on the wheel, the lookout in the bow, the officers who had the watch, dark, ghostly figures in their several stations, but every man among them hummed a Christmas tune, or had a Christmas thought, or spoke below his breath to his companions of some bygone Christmas day, with homeward hopes belonging to it. And every man on board, waking or sleeping, good or bad, had had a kinder word for another on that day than on any day of the year, and had shared to some extent in its festivities, and remembered those he cared for at a distance, and I know they delighted to remember him. It was a great surprise to Scrooge while listening to the moaning of the wind, and thinking about the solemn thing it was to move on through the lonely darkness of an unknown abyss, whose depths were secrets as profound as death. It was a great surprise to Scrooge while thus engaged to hear a hearty laugh. It was greater surprise to Scrooge to recognise it as his own nephew's, to find himself in a bright, dry, gleaming room, with the spirit standing smiling by his side, and looking at that same nephew with proving affability. Ha ha! laughed Scrooge's nephew. Ha ha ha! If you should happen by any likely chance to know a man more blessed in a laugh than Scrooge's nephew, all I can say is, I should like to know him too. Introduce him to me and I'll cultivate his acquaintance. It is fair, is fair, even-handed, noble adjustment of things, but while there is infection and disease and sorrow, 
There is nothing in the world so irresistibly contagious as laughter and good humour. When Scrooge's nephew laughed in this way, holding his sides, rolling his head, and twisting his face into the most extravagant contortions, Scrooge's niece by marriage laughed as heartily as he, and their assembled friends, being and not a bit behind hand, rode out lustily. Ha 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 ha! He said that Christmas is a humbug as I live, cried Scrooge's nephew. He believed it, too. More shame, oh, shame for him, Fred, said Scrooge's niece indignantly. Bless those women, they never do anything by halves. They were always in earnest. She was very pretty, exceedingly pretty, with a dimpled, surprised look, capital face, a ripe little mouth that seemed made to be kissed, and as, as no doubt it was, all kinds of good little doubts, dots about her chin melted into one another when she laughed, and the sunniest pair of eyes you ever saw on any little creature's head. Altogether she was what you would have called provoking, you know, but satisfactory. He's a comical old fellow, said Scrooge's nephew. That's the truth. And not so pleasant as he, as he might be. However, his offences carry their own punishment, and I have nothing to say against him. I'm sure he's very rich, Fred, hinted Scrooge, Scrooge's niece. At least you always tell me so. What of that, my dear, said Scrooge's nephew. His wealth of his new no use to him. He don't do any good with it. He don't make himself comfortable with it. He hasn't the satisfaction of thinking, ha, ha, ha he's ever going to benefit with us with it. I have no patience with him, observed Scrooge's niece. Scrooge's niece's sister and all the other ladies expressed the same opinion. Oh, I have, said Scrooge's nephew. I'm sorry for him. I couldn't be angry with him if I tried. He was suffers by his ill whims, himself, always. Here he takes it into his head to dislike us, and he won't come and dine with us. What's the consequence? He don't, he don't lose much of a dinner. Indeed, I think he loses a very good dinner, interrupted Scrooge's niece. Everybody else said the same, and they must be allowed to have been comp competent judges, because they had just had a dinner, and with the dessert upon the table, were clustered round the fire by a lamplight. Well, I'm very glad to hear it, said Scrooge's nephew, because I have not great faith in these young housekeepers. What do you say, Topper? Topper had clearly got his eye upon one of Scrooge's niece's sisters, for he answered that, he, that as a bachelor was watching out that a bachelor was a wretched outcast who had no right to express an opinion on the subject, whereas Scrooge's niece's sister, the plump one with the lace, took it, not the one with the roses blushed. Do go on, Fred, said Scrooge's niece, clapping her hands. He never finishes what he begins to say. He's such a ridiculous fellow. Scrooge's nephew revelled in another laugh, and as it was impossible to keep the infection off, though the plump sister tried hard to do it with aromatic vinegar, his example was unanimously followed. I was only going to say, said Scrooge's nephew, that the consequences of his taking the dislike to us, and not making merry with us, is, as I think, that he loses some pleasant moments, which could do him no harm. I'm sure he loses pleasanter companions than he can find in his own thoughts, either in his mouldy old office or his dusty chambers. I mean to give him the same chance every year, whether he likes it or not, for I pity him. He may rail at Christmas till he dies, but he can't help thinking better of it. I defy him. If he finds me going there, in good temper, year after year, and saying, Uncle Scrooge, how are you? If it only puts him in the vein to leave his poor clerk fifty pounds, that's something, and I think it shook him yesterday. It was that their turn to laugh now at the notion of his shaking Scrooge? But being thoroughly good-natured, and not much caring how they laugh, what they laughed at, so that they laughed at any rate, he encouraged them in their merriment, and passed the bottle joyously. After tea they had some music. For well, they were a musical family, and knew what they were about. Then they sung a, jig, a glee or catch, I can assure you. Especially Topper, who could growl away in the bass like a good one, and knew, swell, and, knew, and knew a swell the large veins in his forehead, or get red in the face over it. Scrooge's niece played well upon the harp, and played among other tunes a simple little air, a mere nothing he might have learned to whistle in two minutes, which had been familiar to the child who fetched Scrooge from the boarding school, as he had been remindedly, reminded by the ghost of Christmas past. When the strain of music sounded, all the things that the ghost had shown him came upon his mind. He softened more and more, and thought that if he could have listened to it often, years ago, he might have cultivated the, kind, cultivated the kindness of life for his own happiness, with his own hands, without resorting to the sexton spade that buried Jacob Marley. But they didn't devote, devote the whole evening to music. 
After a while they played at forfeits, for it's good to be children sometimes, never better than at Christmas, when its mighty founder was a child himself. Stop! It was a first game of Blind Man's Buff. Of course there was. And no more... Uh, 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 and no more believe Topper was ready blind than I believe he had eyes in his boots. My opinion is that he was a, it was a done thing between him and Scrooge's nephew, and the ghost of Christmas present knew it. The way he went after that plump sister in the lace tucket was an outrage on the credulity of human nature. Knocking down the fire irons, tumbling over the chairs, bumping against the piano, smothering himself amongst the curtains, wherever she went, there went he. He always knew where the plump sister was. He wouldn't catch anywhere anybody else. If he had fallen up against them, as some of them did, on purpose, he would have made a feint of endeavouring to seize you, which would have been an affront to your understanding, and instantly have sidled off on the direction of the plump sister. She often cried out that it wasn't fair, and it really was not. When at last he caught her, in spite of all her silken rustlings and her rapid flustering past him, he got her into a corner whence there was no escape, and his conduct was the most execrable. For his pretending not to know her, his pretending that it was necessary to touch her headdress, and further to assure himself of his identity by pressing a certain ring upon that finger and a certain chain upon her neck, <laughs> was vile, monstrous. No doubt she told him her opinion of it, when another blind man, being in office, they were so very confidential together behind the curtains. Scrooge's niece was not one of the blind man's buff party, but he was made comfortable with a large chair and a footstool in a snug corner where the ghost and Scrooge was close behind her. But she just joined in the forfeits and loved her love to admit admiration with all the letters of the alphabet. Likewise at the game of how, when and where she was very great until the secret joy of Scrooge's nephew beat her sister's hollow. They were sharp girls too, I could have to I, as I could as could have told you. There might have been twenty people there, young and old, but they all played and so did Scrooge wholly forgetting the interest he had in what was going on, but his voice made no sound in their ears. He sometimes came out with the guest quite loud, and very often guessed quite right too, for the sharpest needle, best white chapel, wanted not to cut in the eye, was not sharper than Scrooge, blunt as he took it in his head to be. The ghost was greatly pleased, pleased, <laughs> pleased, to find him in, his, in this mood, and looked upon him with such favour, he begged like a boy to be allowed to stay until the guest departed. This spread said could not be done. Here's a new game, said Scrooge. One half hour spread, only one. It was a game called Yes and No, where Scrooge's nephew had to think of something and the rest must find out what. He only an answering the questions, yes or no, as the case was. The brisk fire of questioning to which he was exposed elicited from the, him that he was thinking of an animal, a live animal, a rather disagreeable animal, a savage animal, an animal that growled and grunted sometimes, and talked sometimes, and lived in London, and walked about the streets, and wasn't made a show of, and wasn't led by anybody, and didn't live in a menagerie, and was never killed in a market, and was not a horse, or an ass, or a cow, or a bull, or a tiger, or a dog, or a pig, or a cat, or a bear. At every fresh question that was put to him, this nephew burst into a fresh roar of laughter, and was so expressively tickled that he was obliged to get up off the sofa and stamp. At last the plump sister, falling into a similar state, cried out, I've found it out. I know what it is, Fred. I know what it is. What is it? cried Fred. It's your Uncle Scrooge! Which it certainly was. Admiration was a universal sentiment, though some objected to the, that the reply to it, is it a bear, ought to have been yes, inasmuch as an answer in the negative was sufficient to have diverted their thoughts from Mrs. Mr. Scrooge, supposing he had ever had any ten tender tendency that way. He's given us plenty of merriment, I'm sure, said Fred. I hope being grateful not to drink his health. Here is a glass of mulled wine ready to your hand at the moment, and I say, Uncle Scrooge. Well, Uncle Scrooge, they cried. A Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year to the old man, whatever he is, said Scrooge's nephew. He wouldn't take it from me, but I may, but he may he have it, nevertheless. Uncle Scrooge. Uncle Scrooge had imperceptibly become so gay and light of heart he would pledge the unconscious com company in return and thank them in an inaudible speech if the ghost had given him time. The whole scene passed off in the breath of the last words spoken by his nephew, and here at the spirit were once again upon their travels. Much they saw, and far they went, and many homes they visited, but always with a happy end. The spirits stood beside sick beds, and they were cheerful. 
on foreign lands and they were close at home, by struggling men and were patient in their greater hope, by poverty and it was rich, in almshouse, hospital and jail, in misery's every refuge where vain man in his little brief authority had not made fast the door and barred the spirit out, he left his blessing and taught Scrooge his precepts. It was a long night, if it were only a night, but Scrooge had his doubts of this because the Christmas holidays appeared to be condensed into a space of time, as if they passed together. It was strange, too, that while Scrooge remained unaltered in his outward form, the ghost grew older, clearly older. Scrooge had observed this change, but never spoke of it, till they left the children's twelfth night party, when, looking at the spirit as they stood together in an open place, he noticed that its hair was grey. Are spirits' lives so short? asked Scrooge. My life upon this globe is very brief, replied the ghost. It ends tonight. Tonight? cried Scrooge. Tonight at midnight. Hark, the time is drawing near. The chimes were ringing the three quarters past eleven at that moment. Forgive me if I'm not justified in what I ask, said Scrooge, looking intently at the spirit's robe. But I see something strange and not belonging to yourself, protruding from the skirts. Is it a foot? Or a claw? It might be a claw, for the flesh there is upon it, was the spirit's sorrowful reply. Look here. In the foldings of its robe it brought two children, wretched, abject, frightful, hideous, miserable. It knelt down at its feet and clung upon the outside of its garment. Oh, man, look here. Look, look down here, exclaimed the ghost. They were a boy and a girl, yellow, meagre, ragged, scowling, wolfish, but prostrate too in their humility, where graceful youth should have filled their features out and touched, but touched them with its freshest tints. A stale and shriveled hand like that of age had pinched and twisted them and pulled them into shreds. But angels might have sat in thrones, devils lurked and glared out menacing. No change no degradation, no perversion of humanity, in any grade, through all the mysteries of wonderful creation, as monsters are so horrible and dread. Scrooge started back appalled. Having them shown to him in this way, he tried to say they were fine children or children, but the words choked themselves rather than be parties to a lie of such enormous magnitude. Spirit, are they yours? Scrooge could say no more. They are man, said the spirit, looking down upon them, and they cling to me, appealing from their fathers. This boy is ignorance, this girl is want. Beware them both, and all of their degree, but most of all beware this boy, for on his brow I see that written which is doom, unless the writing be erased. Deny it, cried the spirit, stretching out its hand towards the city. Slander those who tell it ye. Admit it for your fact fact factious purposes, and make it worse, worse, and abide the end. Have they no refuge or resource? cried Scrooge. Are there no prisons? said the spirit, turning on him for the last time with his own words. Are there no workhouses? The bell struck, tw the bell struck twelve. Scrooge looked about him for the ghost, and saw it not. As the last stroke ceased to vibrate, he remembered the prediction of old Jacob Marley, and lifting up his eyes beheld a solemn phantom, draped and hooded, coming like a mist upon the ground towards him. And that is the end of that stave. I hope you found it enjoyable. I certainly did. I enjoyed reading that. And I hope, as you will have noted, I tried to put a little bit of drama into it as I was going. Thank you so much for listening. It's been quite a long video. And I hope you'll be here for the next instalment next weekend. Bye-bye for now. Stay safe. Stay well.